Good afternoon, and welcome to the Hearts of Freedom project. We really appreciate uh, your willingness to participate in the project. Thanks very much for that. So let me begin by asking you your name, please. My name is Zhang Tri. Okay. And uh, where were you born in Vietnam? I was born in Hanoi, Vietnam. Okay. Um, and around what year were you born? You I recall? was born in 1958. Okay. Yes. Um, and um, do, you, do you remember, do you have memories of your childhood and your adolescence in Hanoi? What, what was it like to grow up there? I um, lived in Hanoi until I was about six years old. Okay. And then, um, and then we were sent to um, the countryside to live with our grandparents um, because of the war. So our parents stay in Hanoi to work, and then we lived with our grandparents um, about 20 kilometers away from the city, the big city. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so you had siblings? I have uh, three other siblings. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, brothers or sisters? I have one brother and two other sisters, but one of the sisters died um, oh. during the war. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, uh, mm -hmm. Are you the eldest or the? I am the second eldest. Second yeah. eldest, yes. okay. Yeah. So your parents decided to, to send you and your siblings to live with your grandparents 20 miles outside of Hanoi. Right, okay. yes. Yeah. It's not just our family, but like all family in the city at that time, during that time, right. had to um, sort of like evacuate from, yes. from the big city to avoid the bombing of the American um, yeah. Right. The war. Yeah. Your parents made the decision to stay behind and work. Yes, they work. have to. They have yeah. to. Yeah. Do you recall what what work your father um, did? I think my my uh, parents they were both um, government official officers. Okay. Yeah. They both worked for the yeah. had for the Vietnamese government. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> when you went to live with your grandparents, do you have memories of what your life was like living there? Um, it was very <coughs> difficult because um, I remember there was seven of us, four from our family and another three kids from my auntie's family. So they all um, lived together under one roof with my grandparents. And we were just ranging from 12, 10 to the youngest was um, like newborn baby. So seven of us, um, it was very uh, crowded at my grandparents' home, and it was very difficult. I remember that we had to uh, um, find our own food, like in the pond. We <laughs> we went to uh, catch a uh, fish, a uh, crab, and uh, that's the in the field to feed ourselves. Yeah, to help with the grandparents. Well, they they provided us food, but it's not enough during the war, so we we had to do that. Yeah. Were, at the time, were your grandparents working? Uh, no, they're, no. Not, they're not working, but they just like, um, uh, my, my grandma, she's selling like little things in the market, yeah, just to help with the, okay. you know, the income, yeah. So you and your, and your siblings and your cousins were preoccupied with going out every day and looking for food? Yes, yeah. Extra food. <laughs> we're not hungry, but we're not starved. But, but it's just like we we are like always, you know. Maybe because we didn't have enough care from you know mm -hmm. busy grandparents, so we just went out on our own and then looking for stuff. Okay. Yeah. And while you were with your grandparents, would you have had opportunities to communicate with your parents every once in a while? Yes, my okay. our parents still. Um, uh, go back and forth every either weekend or every two weeks to bring um, um, food for us, um, mostly rice, like at those days, uh, rice and other kind of um, essential food was rationed, and then everyone had just got a certain amount of food every month. So my parents um, they brought it, uh, those food for us. <clears throat> Would you have had a chance during this, your stay with your grandparents mm -hmm. to go to school? Yeah, we did go to school. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
Everybody, um, you and your yeah, cousins? Yeah, in Vietnam. Went to well, yeah, we, we all went to school, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> um, do you have any, any, what was it like to, to live with your cousins? And uh, did, did you know that your cousins well? Or what was that experience like? Yes, it could have. Um, in Vietnam, um, those days, family members are really tight. Like, we always live together. So it's not much of the conflict, but it's just that at that age, we were, we were fighting a lot, you know, for a small little thing. You know, like seven kids in the family. But um, it's not, um, it's very common that, uh, you know, like children and grandchildren live together with grandparents. In our um, on those days, yeah, not right. anymore these days, but you know, like 40, 50 years ago, it was like that. Right. Yeah. So we, we get along well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. <clears throat> so, um, do you have some idea of how lo for how long you continued your, your education? Did you? Oh, did, I uh, did you went study to into your twenties or? Yes, yeah. I um, finished high school. Um, um, everyone in Vietnam, they go to school, like, okay. you know, no matter how poor they, or we are, how poor they are, but we all go to school. Okay. Um, I went to school, finished high school, and I went to college to study, um, like, the school called Foreign Language College. So I studied there. And then to, uh, when I finished school, I supposed to uh, go to work in, a, like, a province far away from Hanoi, but I didn't want to go, so I stay back and then uh, you know those days if the government send you to work somewhere and you don't go then you don't get the job that you study for so I ended up working as the receptionist in a hotel okay. rather than continuing with my yeah. so the college that you attended was it in the same city as your grandparents oh no it was oh I um, I should um, go back a little bit I um, so after staying with my grandparents for about 10 years or so, no, not 10, well, six years or so, mm -hmm. and then I, we went back to Hanoi in 1972. Okay. And at that time, there was um, a serious uh, bombing by the American um, that's almost like destroyed the whole city. So we witnessed all that. And then the... Um, um, but what they call the, uh, uh, she, sorry, I need to ask uh, Stella. Yeah. Yeah. So the, um, the um, what they call the Paris Accord was signed. Okay. So the war, like at that time, it was ceased for a while. And then, uh, so we went back to Hanoi and then I continued with my school there. Yeah. Okay. So uh, in seventy in nineteen seventy two, yeah. you were able to stay in Vietnam in Hanoi, in Hanoi yeah. and continue college. Yeah, okay. continue with my uh, high school first, and then the college. Yeah. And were you able to complete your cor yes, courses? Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Um, so at, <clears throat> I'm assuming that at some point, uh, you or your family or somehow you came to the decision to leave Vietnam. Can you talk about what that experience yes, was like? Um, it's a long story, even though um, I don't really have a, a compelling story or a dramatic story about my escape to Vietnam like other, you know, like uh, both people. Um, my Your story leaving is, as, the is country. as important as anybody else's. <laughs> yes, but uh, mine <laughs> is pretty easy one but it was deadly um well I'll, I'll just start it with my uh with how um we came to that decision first um yeah. it started with my husband <clears throat> who um he lived most of his life in um, in laos in Vien Chan laos okay. when his um parent brought him um and the whole family from vietnam central vietnam to come to live in laos and um, he lived there and lived there, studied there, and worked there until he was 23 years old. And he uh, then went to uh, Vietnam, to Hanoi, yeah, to work. Um, and then he met me there. 
So he met me in Hanoi, and uh, at that time I was working at a hotel uh, nearby his work. Um, he actually, um, he was actually sent by the, um, the Vietnamese embassy uh, in Laos to Vietnam to work for the government. He worked for the news agency, national news agency in Hanoi. Um, can, I, I, can I just yes. stop you for a minute? Yeah. So just, just for clarification, right. is your husband Laotian or Vietnamese? No, he's Vietnamese. He's Vietnamese. Yes. But he lived in Laos most, most of his life. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yes. So as a child, he would have moved from Vietnam to Laos? Yes. Oh, okay. yeah. His friend brought him there and lived until he was 23 years old. Okay. So, um, so he um, met me um, when he was working for the, um, for the, like his office is not very far from where I worked. So, mm -hmm. and he also stayed at the hotel that I was working. So we got to know each other, and then we start dating, and then um, um, almost a year after we got married, and then <clears throat> my husband, um, when he was sent back there, it all started with. You know, lots of promise and promises and uh, a lot of, you know, good thing to, uh, for him to come back to work because he actually was sent by the government. It's not just his own choice. But um, after working for a while, he found out that uh, nothing was real. Like every promise was just empty promise. Um, so he... He was just um, really upset, and he, at the beginning, he thought maybe he can just, you know, sustain it and then, you know, wait and see what happened. But after a year or so, living and working in Hanoi for that um, agency, for that news agency, he, he saw that everything on the newspaper was just like propaganda, fake news, and all that. So. Um, he probably planning something in his head, but I didn't know. Um, so one day, like in, um, we married for about almost a year, and I remember I was pregnant. My first son, eight months pregnant, and then um, he decided that we go to Laos to visit my uh, my in law, his his father. Um, so we actually left Vietnam by, with passport. We didn't escape from Vietnam. So we went to Laos with, uh, with uh, you know, in a legal way. So once we are in Vientiane, Laos, um, I, um, about a month or so, I had my, uh, maybe my first son born there. And then um, um, I think during my stay there, my husband's family They've been talking and planning for us to leave Laos to go to Thailand, but I didn't know all that because I was busy. I was busy taking care of my um, newborn baby, so I didn't know. Um, but then, at the time that we supposed to go back, because I have to go back to work, and he also have to go back to work, and then he told me that, uh, no, we are not going back. We're going to Thailand. And, okay, can uh, I just stop you because? Yes. I just want to make sure we capture all the pieces. So in Vietnam, yes. you and your husband got married. Mm -hmm. How old would you have been at that time? I was 22, okay. and my husband was 20, 24, 24. Yeah, when we got married. Yeah. Okay. And he was working for a news agency in Hanoi right. at the time, and yes. you were working at the hotel. Yes. And then one day, your husband decided that you should all go and visit his family in Laos. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Okay, <clears throat> so you go to Laos, and then, just for clarification, he's talking with his family, right. and they're thinking that you shouldn't return to Vietnam, and right. you shouldn't stay in Laos, that you should leave both countries. Yes. Okay, Okay. so um, carry on, just for clarification. Yes, sure. So carry on. Um, they probably <clears throat> talked about it, like, previously, when I was in Hanoi, because once my husband found out, you know, what it was like in, in, in Vietnam. And he was, um, he, kept, he kept telling me that, um, jokingly, he said that, uh, honey, because you never left the country, you live here all your life, 
you never know what, was, what is, is like out there in the world. And it was true. It was my first time that I got out of Vietnam. Um, it was in September 1981, my first time at 22 okay. years old. Yeah, 23. Um, and uh, yeah, some, so sometimes he talked about it and I, I had a feeling that he, he, he didn't like it there and he somehow he made his decision um, before we even we came to Laos. So um, when we were there, um, they planned, the whole family planned, and also his brother, older brother, is already in Thailand. And uh, so, um, so that's how um, they make the decision. Um, to be honest, it wasn't my decision, but it was my husband. And um, I don't want to sort of make up story how I left, because of, you know, not um, like opposing the government there, because as I said, my husband said that you live here all your life, so you don't know what it is like mm -hmm. out there in the world. Mm -hmm. And also, we were so heavily influenced by the Russian at that time. In high school, I, I studied Russian, and we watched Russian movie, listened to Russian music, and uh, we are not allowed to listen to BBC radio. If we are caught listening to radio, BBC radio, will be the police will knock at your door. Okay. So that's what happened at that time. But uh, because living all my life in there, I didn't. I can't tell whether it's okay for me or not um, to live like that. I have nothing to compare with. So that's uh, basically that's it. But I'd like to ask you though. Yeah. Uh, when you think about that period in your mm -hmm. life as a mm -hmm. young woman, right. your husband was making decisions right. uh, for for the for your future. Right. Um, what was what was going on in your mind at that time? Because you did have right. family still in in Vietnam, right. and you had met his family in Laos, right. and um, what was following was an important decision to to leave both countries behind. So, how how were you living that yourself? Oh, it was very difficult for me, okay. um, especially when a woman just had a baby. And, yeah. you know, I was torn between my family, um, my, you know, my homeland with all the things that I'm familiar with, and then living in Laos for just about two months, and I, I didn't even know the language. I really wanted to go back, but my husband said that no. He said one thing that I still remember until now, these days, he said, if you go, you can... If you leave now, you can still have the chance to go back. But if you go back, you never can go anywhere else. That's what he said to me. Yes. So, and I thought it's so too. Um, yes. So that's what. Uh, okay. But it was very difficult for me. Yeah. Like I was so depressed, and then at some point, I. It looked like I had no control of my life at that point. So I just follow whatever um, uh, my husband's family and him, um, you know, um, told me to do um, at that time. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you were just talking about uh, your husband's decision that the two of you should leave Vietnam and Laos behind. So can you tell me how, how you went about doing that? Okay, um, so we discussed a lot, um, and I remember there was a lot of crying on my part um, between leaving or going back home. And then eventually um, they convinced me to go, to leave. Um, so it was, um, it was in November 1991. It was winter, supposed to be winter, but in Laos it, it was not that cold. We um, pack our belonging, it's just like a, a handbag, and I carry my baby. We got in um, a taxi, and then the taxi took us all the way to a small village um, <clears throat> far away from Vientiane. And then it's a combination of, uh, of a taxi ride, and then sitting behind the bicycle, and then walking through the forest. Um, I did all that, and I, and I just, this day, I can't understand why I, I could do all that through the night. So 
it was maybe I was just so numb and I couldn't really realize that like what I was doing. So I carried my baby and then we went through all that uh, and so we ended I, up. Could I right? stop you? So what was it like to ride behind a bicycle? Um, very scary. <laughs> I was carrying my baby and like one of the guides just like you know, paddle and then we just behind. I was always like hang on to him because I could, you know, like fall down any time with my baby. And my husband was um, carrying the uh, bag of clothes and some stuff for my baby, like milk and food for him. So uh, was your husband riding the bicycle? And no. You were, no? Um, oh. I guess the family arranged for uh, people who, um, who help us to, oh, to okay. escape. Yeah. So we went with those men, those guys, I would say. Um, so to you, the, you were riding a bicycle ridden by one of the yeah, individuals we'll that the were helping yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, and it was at night, and we ended up in a very um, remote um, village uh, at night time. Um, and we were told to wait there until like midnight or so, and someone would come and get us. And then... To, uh, and then uh, I remember we waited. And then, to be honest, I didn't know what to think, what to do. I just thought, oh, okay, just leave it to God. Whatever happened would happen. <laughs> I had no idea at all. And just holding my baby. And he was put on, I think my, um, my sister-in-law, she gave him some sleeping pills just to keep him quiet. It was amazing. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. <laughs> so, um, so he was pretty quiet um, until okay. So, um, we waited, and then I think we got some food from the man um, in that house. Um, it looked very poor and very um, like he has nothing except just some uh, leftover food, and they fed us. And then um, later on, like past midnight, and then. Three people came to get us to to the boat that the boat that uh, we're supposed to cross the Mekong River. So we got into the boat, um, and then three of those guys who paddled the boats, and then we uh, leave Laos. Um, but it's just about five minutes or so from the shore, and I started to hear the shooting. Mm. Yeah, from shooting from the guards um, on Laos um, side, there were a lot of shooting and bullets like spraying at us. And then uh, I was so like even I lived under the bombing of the American during the Vietnam. War. I never that up close to the bullet. The bullet even splashed the water to the boat that I was uh, sitting on. And at some point, I was <laughs> saying something crazy. I told my husband, please show the bullet for me. <laughs> he's, these days, he still talked to me about it. <laughs> what do you think I would show the bullet for you? <laughs> so saying that, and I try to turn my back to cover my baby. You know, like, yeah. he, to me, you know, he's the only thing in the world that I have to protect. Yeah. So, um, so the bullet was spraying at us, and then... Uh, I thought, oh, that's it. We're gonna die. All die here, and then three guys they jumped off from the boat. They got into the water, and uh, for a split of a second, I thought, oh, they're gonna leave us. They're gonna abandon us here because you know they were um, the police probably discovered we are escaping, and then they probably just uh, abandoned us here. But and then later on, I feel that they are pushing and pulling the boat, so they actually. They are professionals, uh, people are smugglers, so they know what to do. My husband told me later that. So they jump off and then they pull us and then, um, and then um, another maybe 10 minutes later, um, we uh, arrive to the, the other side. Well, not quite the mainland of Thailand, but it's, it's just like a small island, um, but it belonged to Thai um, um, territory. So mm -hmm. we consider ourselves like um, okay. Like yeah. at that point, um, yes. So as I said, it's not um, it's a, it's not a long journey, but it's it's very deadly. Yeah. You could be you know, like shot right at yeah. you know the first bullet. Like later on at the refugee camp, we heard they even put it on the news that. 
they sh shot 50 bullet and because, oh, uh, because of this, because of my son, my baby, he was crying. So they thought, they said, because of the crying baby, that actually saved us. Oh. Yes. That's what they said, because the police, the guard probably heard the baby crying, so they spare us, and then they let us go. Okay. That's what I said. Okay. I'd like to back, back up a little bit, if it's yep. okay. You said that uh, you, uh, you had to ride a bicycle for a period of time because you were going south mm -hmm. from Laos towards right. the shore. Yeah. And then, and then you had to walk for some period yes. of time as well? Yeah. How long would, did that um, last? I just don't remember, but it's just that um, taxi ride for, from the city out to the countryside and then bicycle ride. Bicycle, someone else ride the, rode the bicycle, but I was right. like behind. And then walking to the forest. Um, yeah. yeah, I just can't remember how long it was, but there was that part as well. And my husband and myself, we keep exchanging, um, you know, um, carrying the baby, uh, helping me. He helped me, helped me to carry the baby. And, and was it difficult point, to walk through the forest? Or? Yes, yeah, yeah, it was like I remember dog was barking, um, and I fell down many times. Um, because um, of the dark, and it was very cold, um, and it's not like, it's, yeah, it, it's just very difficult, I remember mm -hmm. that, yeah. And I was just, you know, at that point, I just closed my eye. Whatever happened, I have, <laughs> I have no control, but I just followed my husband and followed those, yeah. you know, guard, those guys that who um, took and, us and, with them. And yeah. what you did is you walked, you basically walked to the shore in South Laos. We walked to the, to the house where they uh, kept us there. Maybe that's the point of uh, meeting. I see. Uh, we stayed there for a while until the, you know, those guys who came to get us. Yeah. To take you to the boat? Yeah. To, yeah. Okay. It's very close to the river, I think, and then okay. we just left that house and walked a little bit to the, to the boat. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, you managed to cross over to Thailand, but as right. you say, yeah. It was a very scary experience. Right. Yeah. It it was um, like we could have died like uh, right from the first shot. I think I don't know why that they <laughs> spare us. Um, we didn't go to um, we didn't get into the mainland of Thailand, but it's on the little island. Uh, we got there first, and then uh, it was very early in the morning. I remember. Um, so those people who just Left. They told us, I just wait here, wait for the Thai police come and get you guys. We just wait here. And uh, we got on the, that little island there, and we feel so scared and so lost because nobody was there. There's some, um, um, some crops on the island there. I guess people from the mainland, they go there to uh, plant their uh, you know, like vegetable mm -hmm. and and corns and crops like that, but it was so early, so nobody was around. So we just um, got on um, and wait, like we just waited there. And then uh, I remember when once we got off the boat, um, um, it, it looked like we walked on the quicksand and I had to raise my baby really high up to uh, keep him from you know, getting wet with the water. And I remember also when we got on that uh, piece of uh, that land, we um, opened his diaper and everything was so wet and so dirty and all that. And I was crying, I said, what would happen now? And my husband was really, he was scared too, but he just said, okay, at least we on the tight side, so we don't have to mm -hmm. worry about the police on the other side anymore. And then we waited for a little bit and then we saw a motorboat, um, I mean the uh, motor boat, yeah, coming in to get us um, with all the um, the police that, and the uh, Thai authority came to get us to the uh, to the mainland. Okay. Yeah. And when you say us, mm -hmm. you, you mean you were on that island, your husband, yourself, and your baby. And my baby, yeah, okay. three of us, yeah. And um, how how was it that the Thai police were in the boat and came to get you? Did they? Did they know they were coming to get you, or they, did, did, they, did they discover that you were there? Um, How did that happen? 
I think it's very close to the to the shore, to the mainland. So they probably they saw us. Yeah, oh, I think. Okay. And also, um, we waited there for a while, and then I saw some uh, farmer. They came to work, so they probably. Um, signal the police or okay. or I assume later I assume that it could be the the very popular point of um, landing when people cross the river right. because it was very um, um, how should I say it's very popular at that time the people from Laos to cross the river and like they ended up at that spot so okay. it looked like they knew that there would be um, someone just you know, cross the river and ended up there, so they came and pick us up. Okay. Yeah. So the police are, are in the boat. They come and pick you up. Right. And can you talk about what happened then? Okay. Um, they took us to the um, police station or the um, either immigration or police station, um, and um, I was questioned. Uh, and. One thing that surprised them was I couldn't speak the language of the Laos, uh, like Laotian language, because I think they suppose if I come from Laos, I have to speak the language. But they keep asking me, I couldn't answer them. <laughs> so they uh, separate, uh, separated us, my husband and myself. I didn't see my husband, and I started crying because I didn't understand a word of Thai either. Mm -hmm. And they look very scary, <laughs> the Thai people. <laughs> um, so they. Um, okay, so just to recap, you mm -hmm. you were brought by the authorities, Thai right. authorities, to the mainland of. Right. So you've been in northern Thailand, right? And you were, and you were probably brought to a police station, right. where you and your husband were separated. Right. Your baby was left with you, okay. and you were questioned. Right. Okay, yeah. So carry on from there. Um, it was very scary because I didn't speak a word of uh, Laotian or Thai. Mm -hmm. um, they um, took all my clothes off to see if I have any uh, mark on me. And um, I think later my husband told me that um, they probably suspect that there are spies from, you know, from Vietnam. So, I'm sorry, but That's so there's okay. a lot of questions. Uh, and they, I think eventually they had to let my husband come over to help to translate because I, could, I couldn't <laughs> understand. So, um, and then, uh, and then we were, held in the detention camp for three days or so um, because they said they had to investigate more and more on me. Um, at that point, I was really um, upset too. I told my husband, why did you do all this to me? And uh, he just tried to you know, calm me down, say, you know, it's, it's the same with everyone. But I said, no, it's not. It, they, do all, they did all kind of difficult thing to me, but anyway, so we were um, held in the detention camp for three days or so, and then um, we were transported to um, um, a permanent camp. It's called um, Nakhon Panom, no, Nong Khai first, yeah, Nong Khai, okay. in northern Thailand, yeah. Um, so um, we stay in that camp. Um, oh, at some point, I think my brother-in-law he uh, came to see us. It was very difficult for a person who got out of the camp and, you know, like travel from, at that time he was, that Nong Khai camp, it was far away from the detention um, center that we were held at. But he probably paid some money to be able to do that. So when I saw him, I was so happy because we know that we are alive. <laughs> mm -hmm. I thought that they're gonna keep me there and, you know, like, you know, I probably would end up in jails and all that. So, um, so later on, we were um, transported to Nong Khai camp. Uh, it's kind of permanent camp, and we stayed there um, next to our brothers, um, like my husband's brother's family. 
he also um, have um, he's been there like before us, maybe a year or so before us, and also waiting for uh, resettle in in the third country. Um, and that's also the reason that he want my husband to come to to live in the camp with him to wait for um, going abroad here. Can I just ask you, not not to, be, to belabor it, but at the time when you were held in detention with the yeah. with the with the authorities, did they yeah. think that your husband was a spy as well, or just you? Um, me mostly? Well, they suspected both of us because um, they probably wondering like why that I if I'm from Vietnam, how how could I escape through Laos? And well, even though there's a lot of Vietnamese who lived in Laos, but at least they, they're fluent in, in, in the language. But mm -hmm. for me, I didn't speak a word. I was yeah. there only like not even two months. Right. Yeah, so maybe that. Well, that's what my husband said, but obviously just, you know, like when immigration or police, if they see something suspect, then they have all their, you know, choice, uh, their right to ask a lot of questions. Like, yeah. I remember that I saw a lot of other people arrive later uh, after uh, we arrived there, but they were just, you know, they were not asked any, or, or maybe just a few questions, and they are released. But for, for me, I was kept there for three days. Yeah, yeah they were yeah. suspicious of yeah. that. Yeah. yeah, something unusual that they, that they didn't see every day there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you, uh, you left from the detention camp to, to Nong Kai, right. and, and how were you transported by Bus I think it, it was the bus, yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, so can you give me, what were your impressions when you first arrived in the non-Kai camp? What, what you're looking at where you are, mm -hmm. what, what, what was the experience like at the beginning for you? Oh, um, i never seen anything like that in my life. I mean, it's the camp, it's a lot of, uh, it's all very, um, well, first of all, it's very hot in Thailand, and it's mm. all like a desert, and then very low building, just like a warehouse. Yeah, it's just like some sort of warehouse. It's not like a building. So we are given a small space, like a living quarter, a small space, about maybe a little bigger than this room, to live for three of us. And um, the building itself is a concrete, but it's just like open all the way through. So they divided it into small um, uh, small uh, space with a bamboo fan. So um, we were given one space like that. And um, every day we go to get the food um, vegetable, cooking oil, um, and other um, kind of food from from the camp. So we line up for it. So we are like everything was um, given to us. Yeah. Okay. And at that time, I think it we had enough to eat though. But it's it's not like fancy food. But we were able to. Um, and I have to say that it's better than food that I used to have in Vietnam, for sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you had, had to line up every day to get um, the, the food? Not every day, but once a week or so. Oh, yeah, okay. we bring it home and then we cook it, yeah. And do you, do you recall where the food would have come from? Or? Um, I think it's local f food, yeah. Okay. And also, if we had money, we can buy food from the market um, just behind the, um, uh, what they call the barbed wire. Yes. Yeah. So as um, Thai people, farmer, they... Um, they were selling their um, like uh, vegetable and meat and stuff like that. So if you had money, you can still buy more food if you want to. Yeah. So you could go outside the camp, go to the not market. Not outside. Oh, no, You're not behind outside. the yeah the uh, fan. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. But you can sort of like it's big enough for you to put out the money, and they can you know give you the food that you. Um, oh, it's like there was a hole in the fence. And yeah, it's, they it's gave you the food wire. and you paid yeah. the money. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, and uh, we have to uh, also water was a limit limited to like you know we have a certain amount of water every day running water um, 
it was clean enough uh, for us at that time, yeah. And um, when you say it was clean enough, do you yeah, like, at that time, I remember. Like, was it organized? Like, were there places to go to the washroom and? Oh, the washroom um, is a um, common washroom. Like a lot of people sharing washroom. It's not our own washroom. Uh, it's like a public washroom. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but it's clean enough. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. It w it was. It looked like it was maintained. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. How long did you stay in the refugee camp, I, um, do you recall? I stayed in that camp for less than a year, and then we were transferred to another camp, um, which, is, which was more permanent than the first camp. Um, it, I remember it was like at the first camp, we were sort of screened by the UNHCR to, um, to move to the second camp. So at the second camp, it looked like we are we were more stable there, so um, um, we started to um, set up an English class in my in my room. <laughs> my in, the, in the second built, camp. In the second camp, okay. because we know that we got to stay there longer. So it's a room bigger than this, a little bit bigger. So my husband bought some bamboo, and then he built the table. He built a chair for the bench for the little kid to come to learn ABC. <laughs> I mean, for me at that time, I taught the little one and my husband was teaching the older one. And um, yeah, it, it was fun and it was helpful because people really, you know, come to, to learn with us. And what yeah. were you teaching them? Teaching English. Teaching yeah, English, at that okay. Time, yeah. <laughs> Even though it's very simple English, but it helped, yeah. And uh, where where had you learned to speak oh, English? Oh, so, as I said, I went to college in Vietnam. Oh, it yeah. was in college, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, how did you spend your days in the first camp? Do the first camp, um, I think I was just busy with my baby most okay. of the time, cooking and doing house chore. But my husband, he actually volunteered with the, uh, the UNHCR um, office there okay. as a translator, yeah. He okay. also um, speaks French, so uh, oh, okay. yeah, so it helps that he uh, volunteered and. Uh, so he would have been trilingual: Laos, English, and French. Laos, Laos, and yeah, English, <laughs> French, and Vietnamese. Yeah. Oh wow! Yeah. Okay. Well, actually, Four when languages. he was in, the, he was working for the news agency. He was in charge of editing the Laos language um, magazine. Okay. Um, yeah. How long did you spend in the second camp? The second camp, uh, more than a year um, there. And uh, yes, and also from the second camp, we were interviewed by the um, Canadian delegation. And uh, we were told that we uh, were accepted um, um, to go to Canada thanks to the sponsorship of the group sponsorship that uh, Brita um, is, um, initiated. And uh, uh, the second camp, it, it got a better situation, better condition than the first camp. And then we were able to go to um, what they call the cultural class um, that we learned about, you know, the life in Canada, the culture and everything, it's just getting ready. Um, did you ever have any opportunities when you were in the second camp to be able to leave, to go, for example, to the city or to, to the market? Um, or did you have to stay in the camp all the time? Um, no, I don't think. Well, sometime my husband, at that time, he was um, um, learning how to, uh, to do like a goldsmith with his brother. And sometimes you, you actually have to pay them to get out of the camp. So mostly just my husband went out with okay. his brother, but not me. Yeah. Okay. Um, and it it also, um, it's not safe for a refugee to go out of in the city. So I remember that we, we didn't want to go out. And also um, uh, only, if we need to buy any, something in, in like outside in the city, then we could ask the people who are um, like in the open market pay the money and then they, you know, they bought it for us and then resell it for us, yeah. But yeah. I didn't have any chance to go out um, of the camp at all, yeah. Right. 
Oh, and also, you. I just want to add more that yeah. uh, um, even though um, in 1982, it was when we started to connect with sponsor, and um, they um, they kept on sending money to us. Like it's not much, maybe just fifty dollars or so a month, but it helped um, quite a bit. Yeah, so we had money. Right. We had money to buy more stuff, um, more food, better food. And, and I'm sorry, the fifty dollars mm -hmm. came from from the sponsor in Canada. This, oh, uh, yeah, Brita. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So in the camp, you were you were already being sponsored. The co the sponsors were sending you money. Um, I I guess when they started to submit their paper, I don't know exactly when, but it just you know she kept sending us letters, and uh, saying that they've already started the process. But in the meantime, like we had to wait for a very long time. Okay. So in the meantime, they just keep sending money to us. Yeah, every. Uh, month okay. yeah, to receive some money. Could you talk a little bit about what the experience was like with meeting with the uh, immigration officials? Yep. First of all, I should ask mm -hmm. you, did you apply to, to uh, come to more than one country? Did you apply just to Canada or did you apply to go anywhere I else? I think my husband also applied to go to Australia, Okay. but uh, we were refused because um, I think you know, one of their relatives like far away relative there, didn't he have enough um, qualification to sponsor? So okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Just Australia and and Canada. And, Canada. Yeah. and you and the family chose to come to Canada. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, uh, just to clarify, so mm -hmm. you had already started to establish a relationship with the person that was going to sponsor you from Canada, right? As that person was sending you some funds yeah. to support you while. Mm -hmm. In the in the second refugee camp. Yeah. Um, I forgot to ask you what the what the do you remember the name of that that second. The second refugee camp is called Nakhon Panom. Yeah. Okay. Nakhon Panom. Yeah. Okay. It's also in northern Thailand. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, and did you spend more time in the second camp than in the first one? More time in the second camp. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, any idea how long you would have been there? Uh, it's probably up to. It's more than more than a year, almost two years. Okay. And then we went to the third camp before we leave. Yeah. A third camp. The third camp, yeah. And what was the name of the that camp? The third camp, camp um, they call it transit camp. Oh, I see. Before okay. we leave, yeah. So we also stayed there for about a month or so. Okay. Uh, it's um, the camp called Panat Nikom. It's in Bangkok. Yeah. So okay. it's just like when people were ready to go abroad, and they were. Um, um, so in the, in the second camp, camp yeah. mm -hmm. it was already established that you were coming to Canada. It, it was already d decided and determined that you were coming to Canada. Yes. In yeah. the second camp. Okay. And then, um, given that that was the case, yeah. they sent you to a transition camp in Bangkok, right. mm -hmm. where you stayed for a month. A month or so. Okay. Yeah. Can you talk about what happened then? Um, that camp was much better. And of course, we were all excited because we know that we are gonna be leaving soon. So um, yeah, so we just like I th I, I think we just went to um, the um, the workshop, the classes every day to um, to learn about the Canadian culture and all that. And uh, my husband continued to volunteer with the um, with the. Um, the charity group there, they're from, they're from the Mormon um, church, yeah. Okay. So, um, yes. Um, so time just gone very fast when we were there <laughs> until the day we, uh, we left. And I remember we had a chance to go out to the city to buy some stuff before we left. And I brought, I brought a set of uh, steamer that I still keep until this day. <laughs> <laughs> the cooking set, yeah, okay. yeah, because we had nothing to bring with us to Canada, and yeah. um, we um, uh, we are allowed to. I still keep my uh, airplane ticket. Oh, yeah, from that from that flight that trip from Thailand to Canada, 
and uh, we are allowed to bring 20 kilos for each person. And we try to think about what to bring, but we didn't have anything. We didn't have much. I mean, not anything, but we didn't have much. So we, we went out to buy a cooking set, <laughs> and I still keep it to this day. Okay. Still use it this day, yeah. It still, it still works. Ago. Yeah, it still works. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. So can you, can you describe what was that experience like? So you leave the transition camp to come mm -hmm. to Canada. What, what was the steps that you went through to? Um, please? We left the camp. Uh, I just remember that we were very happy, and they had some sort of a like a small party for us. The volunteer, yeah, the uh, volunteer from uh, Mormon, Mormon um, Church. They had a little party for us, so we took pictures. Um, those day, every time it, you want to take picture, it costs about twenty baht, about like a dollar or so, and you have to hire. <laughs> a photographer if you don't have a picture that take like every day like what we have now. So I remember um, we took a few pictures before we left and then uh, we had a little party and then we were, the bus took us to the airport. Um, the airport, it was um, still the old airport, um, it's called Don Mung Airport or something, yeah. Um, now it become the domestic airport, but um, at that time we went to the airport and everyone was so happy. We went with, uh, on that trip, there were a few people that we lived on the same, um, in the same um, building with us. So uh, when we arrived into Vancouver, those people, they stay in Vancouver, but we had to continue with the flight to Kelowna. Okay. Yeah. And I remember a funny thing happened in um, Vancouver at YBR there. Um, I remember they gave us, uh, because it was winter, so they gave us like a jacket. So um, I remember I want to pick like the different color, something to do with the color, I picked the red. And then to, uh, the women who worked there, they thought that I didn't understand English. And then they said something kind of mean to me, to them, like among them. They said, oh, so fussy, what color? Why are you picking different color? They said something like that. I, I, I could understand, but I didn't say anything. Okay. Yeah. So at YBR, we were given some uh, big jackets. And then uh, we waited for a while. And then we continued with our flight to uh, Kelowna. Yeah. So you flew right from uh, Bangkok right. to, to Vancouver. I, I don't remember if we transit anywhere, but it, it looked like we just go straight. Yeah, I checked. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And from, from Vancouver to Kelowna? Kelowna, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, did you, did you, is, is that where you decided to stay? In um, it's not our choice it, because of the sponsorship. Um, then their commitment is they have to um, sort of support us in the first year. Um, so. And also, we, we don't know anyone. We didn't know anyone um, mm. anywhere. So we, and also, Prita, she's very helpful. She, she's just like a, you know, she, she was so caring for us. She's just like a family member. She, wait, she waited and waited for us, longing to see us. So um, obviously, we, we wouldn't live anywhere except, you know, to live with, with nearby um, where they live. So. Um, they came and picked us up at the airport um, with uh, her boyfriend then, but now her husband. Um, we, they took us to, uh, I think, because we also have relatives um, who come to, who came to Canada previously, who lived in Summerland, and those relatives are the one who introduced uh, Brita to us. Yeah. They talk, they asked Brita to help us out, so that's why um, Brita knew us. Yeah. Uh, so we went to live with the relative for some time. And then uh, that relative also worked at the greenhouse. And the greenhouse owner was one of the group sponsorship member. So my husband, um, after t only two days resting in Canada, he started to work right away at the greenhouse for, for that uh, 
and in, in Kelowna. And no, it was in Summerland. In Summerland. Summerland. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think Kelowna is at the airport, and then he and we were, um, our sponsor drove us to Summerland. Yeah. Okay. It's a long way. I remember. And all we saw was just snow, <laughs> and nobody saw <laughs> like on the street. Um, so my husband started working for that greenhouse, and then later on we moved to a small like a mobile home next to the greenhouse so, because we didn't have a car at that time. So we lived there for a while and then um, when can, I had my baby. Can second I ask baby, you, yeah. the person who sponsored you, right. you said her name was, was Britta. Yeah. Uh, did she work with a group of sponsors? Did she do this by herself or how, how did the sponsorship yes, work? Yes, it, it was a group sponsorship. Um, okay. She, um, you would find out later in her, um, in her um, um, written submission, yeah, you can yeah. say that, um, um, that she, there's a, the church that she um, attended, there's a, a refugee committee, and she also was sponsored um, another Vietnamese, her parents also sponsored another Vietnamese uh, family okay. prior to us. So she involved with that committee, and she um, uh, also because of our relative who asked her, and then, she formed a group of five people. Um, they were teachers and uh, one of the farmer that my husband ended up working for him. Um, so yeah, it's a group sponsorship, it's not a personal. Uh, um, you wouldn't be able to sponsor a stranger as a personal, like a one single person, no, you cannot. Except your relative or a government sponsor or a group sponsor, yeah. Okay. So in this case, a uh, group sponsor, yeah. Um, so you established yourself in, in, in Summerland, you call um, um, I We lived there um, for more than a year when my second son was born in 1985. Um, so more than a year. And then... Um, and how old was your first son by the time? Yeah. At that time he... When he came to Canada, he said three and a half, and then okay. by then he, he, he would be uh, five, four, five, five. Okay. Um, and then my husband, after he worked at the greenhouse for a while, the job was so heavy for him, because he's small, and then the work at the greenhouse is very uh, difficult, very heavy for him. So he um, left the job there, and then he worked for um, a company that the manufacturer uh, uh, fiberglass cup, uh, can canopy, canopy fiber, okay. fiberglass canopy. Nice. Yeah, and then um, and then when I had my second boy, he was about he was about a year old. So, and then one day we visited um, Vancouver. My husband you know, drove us to uh, Vancouver to visit. And uh, as soon as I see Chinatown, I see <laughs> Vietnamese food, I decided to stay. I don't want to go back at all. So that's why we ended up in Vancouver. Okay. Uh, my husband rented a, a truck to go back to uh, get our belonging, and then I stay back uh, in Vancouver. And then we just left somewhere and Okay. For good, <laughs> it's not that that we uh, don't like it, but it's just so quiet, so um, no job opportunity at all. Like mm -hmm. if I was there, I I wouldn't be able to find work at all. Um, and uh, of course, once you see Vancouver, you see Chinatown, you see <laughs> the Vietnamese community here, you just want to go back to your, you know, yeah. root and everything. Yeah. So when you left to come to Vancouver, did you stay in, in, in contact with your former uh, sponsor? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We maintain okay. contact until this day. Yeah. Oh. We uh, yeah. It's not just because of this project, but uh, um, yeah. Every time there's a big event in our life, uh, we update each other. Um, um, we actually attended her wedding before we left. Yeah. Oh. In 1980. Sick, yeah. Okay. So, how many children do you have? I have two. Okay, two boys. Two boys, yeah. Okay. They are adult now, yeah. Okay. 
and uh, did they go on to to school and to oh yeah they um they're working careers? yeah yeah, they, yeah. okay do they have families of their own oh my oldest son has already yeah has the one uh, daughter so I'm a grandma now okay <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and what what is your husband doing now my husband he's um he's a mechanic like aircraft okay. maintenance yeah mechanic, okay yeah so and are you still employed me myself I'm just working part time as a um, court interpreter. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So just on call. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So to recap, uh, you told me about how your sponsor helped you to establish yourselves in Summerland, your husband, yourself, and your son. You get an opportunity to go and visit Vancouver, and you get excited about that, about uh, Vancouver, because you see that there's a Chinatown and a Vietnamese community, etc., and express an interest in establishing yourself in Vancouver. So your husband rents a truck, and everybody and the family moves to Vancouver. So can you talk about what, what it was like to settle in Vancouver, please? We started with um, we reconnected with a friend who used to live in the refugee camp with us. They live on the east side of Vancouver near Trollic Park. Uh, and we uh, first stayed at uh, in their basement suite, very uh, small little uh, space there. Um, and I started to no, my first um, my husband's first job in Vancouver was we um, we bought a very old truck, and then he went to pick up cardboard. At that time, they said you can uh, make a living by uh, recycling the cardboard. And we did it for one or two times. We also tried to uh, work at the um, mushroom farm. And I think we tried either one or twice, also quit that. And then... Um, so when you say you, you, you collected cardboard, right. and you said we, do you mean you and your husband? My husband and myself. Oh, you worked, yeah. oh, you we did that uh, left okay. our kid with the uh, family that we uh, reconnected those people who used to live in the camp with us. Okay. They are Laotian people. Um, so we left uh, our kid with them. And then um, we, it just at that time, I, I just remember that my husband said, we have to do, we have to do anything to make a living. And uh, through all those first um, year and well, moving to Vancouver is really has a price to pay. Like if we still back in Summerland, maybe he still had had his job and it was a good job for him. But uh, when we moved to Vancouver, he lost his job, and then um, we just have to start it like all over again. So we went to uh, bought an old truck to pick up the cardboard, and I remember we went to the back lane of um, Chinatown uh, store to pick up those cardboard, and we did it twice. We also try on. Um, uh, mushroom uh, cutting uh, didn't work out, and then uh, I later I found um, a factory job. Yeah, that make um, that makes uh, what is that the um, the fishing the fishing tackle the hook okay. and yeah stuff like that. Uh, and at that time, there's a lot of Vietnamese people who work there, so I worked there for a while. And then um, my husband. He uh, at some point he said, "Oh, we can't live like this. Uh, we have to. Ha I have to have a career to support my family." So he um, he um, I, I I forgot what he um, what he worked, and then he got some EI um, benefit, and then he went on to um, to take a training uh, program at BCIT, yeah. and then after that he got uh, a good job. Um, Working at the um, on the airplane okay. maintenance, yeah, and he still at this. Uh, he's still doing this to this day. Okay. Yeah. Um, for myself, I uh, started my job at a three or four jobs before I uh, before I really um, had a chance to actually use my. Um, language, English language skill to do something that is 
less of the labor kind of work, um, but more of the, um, uh, for some reason, I, I just feel that I have a, a tendency to help people. So I, as soon as my um, second son, he was five years old and he went to preschool, I went to volunteer with Mosaic, uh, one of the immigrant serving agency in, mm -hmm. in the lower mainland here. And I did, uh, like I would volunteer anywhere that they need um, mostly like translation. So I started with volunteer uh, work for those um, organizations, agencies. And then in 1990, I was, um, um, I wouldn't say promoted, but they gave me a, like a temporary job as a like teaching assistant to a group of Vietnamese people. Well, uh, those days I don't know why they they always need an interpreter to help with learning the language, which is not <laughs> not a good way to teach. But I don't know why. I mean, so I was doing that for about a year or so, and then. Um, at one point, there was, um, um, and then also at that time, I, I involved myself in a lot of uh, community activities, like, uh, um, and uh, you know, participate in in group, um, you know, activities and volunteers and all that. And I came to know of the Vietnamese Women's Society, where um, Stella here, she's uh, also the leader of that group. And then um, um, it was in the early 90s, and uh, I remember it was um, there was an, an influx of refugee from um, Vietnam as well as from um, uh, the former Yugoslavia coming to to uh, Canada, and um, Stella told me about a position, a job position at uh, the Immigrant Services Society. And uh, she suggested that I should apply. So I went to apply for the job, and I was interviewed by Stella, and I was accepted. Um, I was given the job at uh, the Immigrant Services Society, and I worked there for nine years, almost 10 years. Um, and uh, yeah, that's the, it was a really nice job. It, uh, it fit with my desire to help people and also um, um, also the place that I can use my personal experience to uh, to relate with the people who are refugee and uh, mm -hmm. the plight that they've gone through to be able to come to Canada so it was really a fulfilling job and I was happy very happy at that time great so at this point <coughs> What I'd like to ask you as a final question is, yes. one of the main uh, goals of this project is to teach the, the young Canadian uh, population about what that part of history of Canada was like. So <clears throat> if you wanted to, if you were provided with an opportunity to, to talk to the, to the younger generation about that experience, what, what, is, what do you think would be important to tell them? Well, first of all, um, I told my children, well, as, as far as, as long as they un they old enough to understand, so we told our children about our life story, about the refugee camp and all that. And I think all those years that I worked with the refugee, with the immigrant and refugee myself, I think that um, personally, I think what I've gone through really enrich my life, first of all, um, unlike, um, you know, people who just grow up in one place and then live there all their life and die and all that. But for me, for myself, it's um, a very um, um, compelling experience that we've gone through all those um, experience, um, whether it's difficult or happy, but we've gone through all that. So for my personal, it's really um, like you have something to tell your children, your uh, mm -hmm. your friends. Um, but um, in general, I think for um, 
for the younger generation, I think if they can understand that each person have their own life and each person um, um, coming to, when they come to this country, um, as Canada is a, a multicultural um, country and we embrace the multiculturalism, um, so we should um, have that kind of mindset in, in your um, thinking to um, tolerate all the differences um, in this society. And that's really uh, important for us to uh, live in Canada. And yeah. I'm, uh, I feel that we are, my family and myself, we are so lucky to uh, choose to come to Canada, to live in Canada. Thank you.